Chapter 10 Wives and Warfare Details of the life of Muhammad, the man, were central to the institu institutionalizing sorry, of Islam as religion and the shaping of the customs and conventions of the daily life of Muslims. It is hardly surprising that the character of Muhammad should be central to the criticism of Islam that arose in the Western Christian world. From the earliest reports of the new religion written by John of Damascus, 1645 to, okay, 64, it goes all the way to 749, makes him like 104. There's another number in there, I can't be bothered. Okay, John of Damascus, an official in the court of the Muslim Khalif, Yazid II, to the 18th century Enlightenment thinkers and the 19th century Orientalists, such as William Muir and Father Henry Lamens. This critique has had two consistent themes, warfare and wives. For example, two luminaries of the Enlightenment, Voltaire and Volney, describes Muhammad in all the colours of darkness. So for Voltaire, Muhammad was a false prophet who had founded a barbaric cult. And in his novel, Les Runes, Les Runes, Les Runes, C.F. Volney portrays Muhammad as a violent leader determined to subdue with a saber those who refuse to believe in his law. Similarly, because of his multiple marriages, Muhammad was depicted as a licentious man. Much of this criticism has resurfaced in the 21st century from the more extreme right-wing neoconservative writers. So Western scholars are hardly in a position to throw such criticism at Muhammad when we consider Christianity's record on wars and violence and the West's own history. But one can ask a more pertinent question. Given the circumstances of time and place, is it conceivable that Muhammad's mission could have been accomplished without his battles? In the early part of his mission, as we have seen, Muhammad certainly avoided conflict as much as possible. His community had neither the strength nor the resources to do so otherwise. And after the Hijrah, it is evident that the military options were adopted. The mental images conjured by the language of war and battles for a modern reader is perhaps not the best way to think about the kind of clashes that took place in Muhammad's time. Both in the battles of Badr and Uhud lasted less than a day and the battle did not even take place in the Battle of the Trenches. The longest period Muhammad himself was engaged in military encounter was the Siege of Khaybar. Thus, in the period of 23 years, the guy needs to sort out the um, spelling in this book. Thus, in a period of the 23 years during which he was a prophet, Muhammad spent only a few months engaged in fighting. And there were many others raids, raids and clashes involving Muhammad's followers. The classical sources make no secret of these minor encounters with the enemies who sought the obliterations of the nascent Muslim community. Indeed, the entire genre of the biographies of the Prophet began as works that recorded these skirmishes. Arabia was a society and culture deeply wedded in the code of the warrior where raiding, looting and plundering were endemic. To survive, the Muslims had to defend and fight. The important caveat is what the Qur'an contains is as clear ethic. A kind and just war theory, inclusive of a Geneva Convention on the rules of war. These make clear what war must only be defensive in nature. Civilians, women, children and the elderly could not be attacked. Places of worship or whatever kind, churches, synagogues, temples and mosques, could not be ransacked. And animals, water sources and crops could not be destroyed. Furthermore, if the enemy asks for peace, the offer must be accepted immediately. Muslims have fared no worse than followers of other prophets. And at times they have fared much better in pursuit of peace, tolerance and living together with peoples of other faiths and cultures. The matter of Muhammad's marriages also has to be taken in context. 
Marriage is the lubricant of a society based on kinship, such as the tribal society of the 7th century Arabia. Indeed, marriage has been the means of creating and cementing relationships among rulers and leaders of innumerable, innumerable societies of vastly different kinds up until very recent times. It should not surprise us then that most of Muhammad's marriages had a political context. Muhammad married 11 women in all, but for most of his life, he was monogamous, married to his first wife Khadija for 25 years. After the death of Khadija in 619, 16, 619 of the Common Era, and while still in Mecca, he married Soda Bint, Bint means daughter, Soda, the daughter of Zamma, a recent widow, and Aisha, the daughter of his closest companions, Abu Bakr. I can feel the heat coming from, what's it called, some of the listeners to this, Aisha. Shenanigans. Eight of his marriages occurred after he arrived in Medina and became the leader of the community. In addition, he also had a concubine, Maria al Gibtia, a Coptic Christian Egyptian sent as a gift by a Byzantine official. She was the only one that Muhammad, of all Muhammad's wives, apart from Khadija, who bore him a child. Their son Ibrahim died in infancy. And then there was Rihanna, the daughter of Zaid, captured and defeated, captured after the defeat of Banu Qureza, which makes a Jewish. Classical sources differ over whether she was a concubine or eventually married to Muhammad. Together, they are known as the mother of believers. Is it Rihanna? I can't remember anyway. Anyway, let's have a think. Okay. Mothers of Believers. This is another section. We list down all the, uh, the wives of the Prophet. So the first one is Khadija, daughter of Khuwailid. Soda, daughter of Zamma. Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr. Hafsa, daughter of Umar. Zainab, daughter of Khuzayma. Hind, daughter of Abu Umayyah. Zainab, daughter of Jash, Juwariya, daughter of Al Harith, Rihanna, daughter of Zaid, Safiya, daughter of Huyay. I think my no, no, I can't remember the, the Jewish wife's name anyway. Ramla, daughter of Abu Sufyan, Maria Al Kibtiya, and Maimuna, daughter of Al Harith. The early, earlier marriages aimed at cementing relationships with the core group of Muhammad and his adherents. Muhammad married his own daughters to his companions. Ruqayya and Umm Khaldun both married Umar. Fatima was married to her cousin Ali, one of the strongest supporters of Muhammad. And apart from Aisha, Muhammad also married Hafsa, the widowed daughter of Umar. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali were among Muhammad's closest and most important companions and would each in turn become Khalif, literally successors to Muhammad. As the leader of the Muslim community, these marriages constituted the glue that bound his companions to Muhammad. The later marriages cemented tribal alliances or served as rationales for reconciliation. So for example, Juwariya, daughter of Harith, was taken captive in the skirmish with Banu Mustalik, during which her husband was killed. And when Muhammad married her, and it came to be known to the people of Mustalik that Muhammad had married her, they were now kinsmen to the Prophet. Other Muslims immediately released their captives. Ramla or Umm Habiba was a daughter of Abu Sufyan, a leader of the Meccan elite who so fiercely opposed Muhammad. This marriage was an alliance with one of the most influential citizens of Mecca. Two of Muhammad's marriages have become quite controversial. The first is with Aisha, whom he married 
when she was said to be nine or ten, said to be nine or ten gone, and he was thirty-five, no, fifty-three. Sorry, thirty-five. He was fifty-three. Convention about the age of marriage are culturally determined, and have changed radically over time. Child marriages and considerable age difference were no impediment within the cultural context of seventh-century Arabia. Hang on, how does he know what the cultural context of 7th century Arabia is? Women were able to be married immediately after beginning menstruations, a sign of maturations that has been the threshold of most societies throughout much of human history. Should a prophet have been an example of how society and its sensibilities would change over millennia? Is it proper to apply contemporary sensibilities? The modern construction of childhood to a person who lived entirely hang on who lived entirely different circumstances hang on a sec this is, this is a bit messed up okay uh, is it proper to apply contemporary sensibilities the modern construction of childhood to a person who lived entirely different circumstances hang on so contemporary sensibilities of the modern construction of childhood it's also, it does make sense, okay. There's a problem with um, age and numbers. I mean, the report about Aisha's age that came 200 years after the prophet hooked up with Aisha. So it's about an eight or ninth century. But the problem is, and the question that I ask is, what number system were they using? So you've got the decimal system, which goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then you've got the binary system, it goes zeros and ones, zeros and ones. And then you got the hexadecimal system, which when you write it out, it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? Now, you start looking at what's happening in, what's it called, um, the Hellenistic, the Roman Empire. They've got that I, 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 then I, V, then V, then V, I, I. So it's got some funky I, V, X, L's and all those other funky stuff that goes on. So it wasn't a decimal system there. And then you look at Persia, uh, the Babylonians. So they had like the base 60. So it goes up to um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then they had all these funky symbols going all the way to up to 60. What number system were the Arabs using? That's the thing to ask. Um, so you start thinking about looking into the history of numbers. I was kind of studying this some time back. Um, the one question to ask is, when was zero determined? How did they find out what zero is? It's like when the Greek says, how can you make nothing out into something? That's the thing that the problem they had about zero. They couldn't identify zero. That came in the ninth century. And the prophet existed in the seventh century. They didn't have a script. How can they have a number system? They don't even have a script. So how can he say nine or ten years of age of Aisha? No one knows how old she was. Maybe what was nine, written down as nine, could mean another number. We don't know that. And then you look at other reports that Aisha took part in battles. And you had to be a certain age to take part in a battle. They said that she picked up arrows and gave it to the prophet. So this is kind of messed up. So you can't just add modern sensibilities of culture. There's also modern sensibilities of sciences. You can't apply them today back to what was happening during the Prophet's time. So this guy messed up, mate. <laughs> A reason-based Muslim. <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, let's talk about this. Carry on reading. I'm just ranting, okay. Is it worth noting that criticism of this marriage has appeared only in modern times? And apologetics of this marriage, which kind of all goes messed up, is also applied in modern times as well. What is abundantly clear from the sources is that such a marriage, not consummated until Aisha had achieved what was regarded as maturity, caused no comment in Mecca at the time or in the Christendom of the Middle Ages. But this is because it was, she was of that age we don't know how old she was and there's no way of knowing how old she was what you need to do you need to find out what number system they were using in 6th 7th century Arabia before you can make a comment about her age anyways doesn't matter then. the second marriage was Zainab bin Jash the daughter of Jash who was Muhammad's cousin 
did raise eyebrows in Arabia. It is the only marriage to be specifically mentioned in the Quran. Zainab was married to Zayd, Muhammad's adopted son, but Zainab was not happy and the brothers too rejected Zayd because they were of an aristocratic lineage while he was, he was a slave. He had been a slave. Muhammad intervened to urge them not to divorce and when the couple divorced, Muhammad married Zainab. It was the legitimacy of this marriage that is authorised by the Quran. The convoluted argument of the classical scholars as well as modern writers cannot take us beyond the simple facts. It was a subject of controversy in Muhammad's time as it remains today. What is more significant is that all of Muhammad's wives except Aisha had been married before. This would have been a considerable change in a society in which virginity on marriage was a significant badge of status. Moreover, Muhammad appreciated and respected his wives as independent women, women who were helpers and supporters in his mission. There is no trace of misogyny in his treatment of his wives or women in general, born into a society in which female infanticide was practiced. Muhammad proclaimed that those who loved their daughters and did not prefer their male child to her shall enter paradise. He is also reported to have said that if one wanted to know the character of a man, one should inquire about the condition of his wife. How beautiful. This is another section. There's much discussion in the classical sources about the beauty of Muhammad's wives. It's difficult to assess whether this was purely conventional or a detail serially embellished by later sources as something befitting the status of the Prophet. One suspects that the classical sources are telling us more about the outlook and attitudes of the writer than how it was in Medina. But there is no doubt that Muhammad himself enjoyed the company of women and a robust sex life. So it tells you something about this writer of this book. But it's kind of like saying that one suspects that the classical sources are telling more about the outlook and attitude of the writers than how it was in Medina. Now going back to Aisha, that report came from Abu, uh, was called Al-Bukhari, which is like one of the um, writers of the Gospels of Muhammad. That was written two centuries later. He wrote it. Uh, yeah, I don't want to rant anywhere. I've talked enough about that. And his wives were not mere trophies. They were independent-minded and played a significant part in the political life of the Muslim community after the Prophet's death. All who had converted to Islam before the Hijrah, Sauda, Hafsa, Zainab, Um Salma, Um Habiba, must have had strength of character and determination. Hafsa was not, was not only feisty, but also literate and became the custodian of the original compilation of the Quran, on which Uthman's authoritative text is based. Zainab was renowned for her work among the destitute and earned the nickname the Mother of the Poor for her generosity and charity. Um Salma is credited with providing the strategy that helped Muhammad quell the dissension among his followers over the concession he made in the Treaty of Hudabiyah. Most important and forthright of them all was Aisha. This is, okay, the bride who grew up in Muhammad's house household. She became a major figure in the political battles of the early Muslim community and by virtue of her close relationship with the Prophet, a principal source of information about his life, his character and his actions. The very foundation of the report that became Hadith, which is the Gospels of Muhammad, the statements and the actions of Muhammad. Thus, his wives were the prototype of a new social compact Muhammad was seeking to create in which women were encouraged to come forward as active participants in society, as friends and helpers alongside their menfolk. It is clear that Muhammad valued their advice and contributions onto his mission. Tracing the rationale behind Muhammad's marriages or his battles does not alter or apologize for the basic facts. However, the details are an essential part of forming a reasoned opinion on the subject. 
Muhammad was a man of his time, shaped by the conventions and traditions of the world into which he was born into. Within such context, he was clearly an enlightened man who saw radical change to set his society on a better moral and ethical path. I'm going to put a link at the end of this talking about the number systems of uh, the Egyptians, of the Babylonians, of the Mayans, of the, uh, what's it called, the Greeks, or the Romans. I'm just going to leave it to you about asking the question, what number system did the Arabs use? Okay.